What's it like outside, Har? It's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. We just came back from a walk. What, Har? It's 62 degrees, sun is out. Perfect. Nice and the good part about everybody not driving is that the air is quite clear. <laughs> yeah, and there's no cars. <laughs> there's a lot of good things about people not driving. Yeah. All right. So what are your burning questions so far? Who's Becky? I don't know where Becky is. That's okay. Uh, oh, cool. Glenn, I think... Uh, my, hey. my question, Glenn, is... Uh, hi, John. How you doing there? <laughs> I can't believe I figured this out. <laughs> my question going back to the. To the <laughs> my first Zoom meeting. What's your question? Um, uh, thinking without being political, really, truly. Um, You're good. Okay. How close are we to to? comfortably now I, I realize we're in all all in different locations maybe all different states but how close are we to uh, a safe and I know it'll never be a hundred percent safe not for a long long time but uh, to getting back to, to normal I mean the people who are, are spouting that it's terrible for the economy it is terrible for the economy people people are literally on the verge of starving I think that we don't even realize but um, I don't know what the trade-off is. What do you think, Len? Yeah, give me one second. Uh, I should have printed out this picture. Uh, and again, it's not political because different parts of the country are quite different. Right. Yeah, so there's some people who have been doing some modeling to see when it would look like for us to be able to open up again. And it's, it, we can open up. It's just when we open up, the earlier we open up, the more likely that there will be more uh, another wave. The only thing that's going to prevent us from having another wave is if we have sufficient testing and contact tracing. It looks like at this point, we're probably going to have sufficient testing because there's multiple companies that are ramping up now. And there's a, a bunch of companies that are working on like 10 minute, 15 minute test results, uh, tests. And so that's really good. The problem is that you can't just let anyone get tested on their own, like a pregnancy test. For something like this, in order for it to be effective, you need contact tracing. So you need, once if someone is positive, to be able to go and interview them and say, where, did you, where could you have gotten this from? Who could you have given it to? So because of that, you can't really have anonymous tests. Um, and so it's, a, so it, it, it's gonna, that, that's the biggest problem. The tests we can do on a commercial, like using the laissez-faire market, the tests, we can get the tests. But the contact tracing is a pure public health. Um, how, clo how, how close are we to that Google, Apple kind of application where they trace by Bluetooth? Um, I have no idea. The problem is, is that requires, I think, probably opting in. Because mm -hmm. there's, you know, here's, here's, like, there's a lot of questions that we haven't really expo uh, explored yet in this country. But what are we going to do with, in a situation like this? What if someone is infected or a couple of people are infected? They realize that the person who must have infected them was John Adams. And so then someone from the public health department wants to go and test John Adams and John Adams refuses. What are we going to do if this person is going around infecting people and won't, and, and, and won't get tested and won't quarantine? And so we have laws that enable us to forcefully quarantine people like that and forcefully test them. But a lot of that stuff is at the federal level. And so what do we do in that situation? Mm -hmm. um, and it's the same thing with the privacy rights when it comes to tracking people. Um, if you have a Google app that can track your location and tell everyone else around you, they're probably going to make it so it's opt in. Um, here, wait, wait one second. I'm going to somehow escalate Becky. <laughs> um, there she is. Hi. Right. Hey, Becky. I think I've just escalated you to host. Okay. So Sounds can you good. Please, 
Can you please <laughs> admit everyone uh, that they as they come in and deal with anything that needs dealing with? Okay, I have my assistant here. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, and so, so what does that mean for when we when we uh, open things back up again? Um, it's tricky. Like so, so right now. So that you've heard of this thing called herd immunity, and herd immunity takes place. It, it depends. Herd immunity varies by the virus. The faster a virus spreads, the larger the number of people need to be infected to prevent additional people from getting infected. So if you have a, a virus that just doesn't infect very many people, then in order to get herd immunity, you need far, far less people vaccinated or, or previously exposed to, to prevent new occurrences. The problem is with this uh, virus, it seems like the number of people, that the spread rate is a lot faster than we thought before. Um, when we're going back and looking at some of, some of the previous data, it seems like the R value, which we thought previously was two to three, might now be closer to five, which is, and so we've heard about these stories about like these super spreaders or something in New York or New Jersey, where you could have had one person who infected dozens of people. And so if that's the case, then that means that the R value is much higher. And, and there's a couple other facts that are influencing this. One is that we're, we're finding that people can shed the virus before they're symptomatic and after their symptoms go away, they can continue shedding the virus for one to two weeks. And so the biggest part is that apparently much of the viral shedding is occurring at the very beginning, even before symptoms start, when they're first asymptomatic. Mm -hmm. And that makes it really a challenge to then contact trace because all the people that are being exposed in those couple of days prior are then walking around and, and potentially, it's, it still takes up maybe four or five days to incubate, but so that does give us a little bit of, of leeway to, of, of time to find people who are potentially exposed and then have in quarantine for a week. But, um, but it's, it's going to be a logist, logistically, this is going to be a nightmare. And when we open is how uh, comfortable we are, how confident we are in our logistical response. I mean, frankly, the United States federal government is one of the best organizations in the history of the world in logistics. Like you figure with the military, they need to understand to, if you have troops on the ground, you have to get them the water they need, the ammunition they need, the supplies, everything has to come and be at the exact place at the exact time. And so I did some, uh, some work, some consulting work for the military health service and the Veterans Health Administration when I was living in DC and they know logistics, they, they're, they're good at it. I don't know if they're communicating with the state level public health folks though. And so what this is really an issue is, it's truly logistical stuff. It's a logis logistical burden. And I don't know um, when we're gonna be at capacity for that. I think it's gonna vary a lot by states. Um, and, but what do we do if Pennsylvania, I think so right now apparently, New Jersey, New York, Pennsylvania, so a bunch of the East Coast states are organizing together. And so they're doing their logistics together in terms of the contact tracing as they're ramping it up. But um, if Pennsylvania, decides that they want to just let people go out and, and they're not going to quarantine people and they're going to release the lockdown and New Jersey says no we're getting we're we're uh we're, we're going to remain in lockdown or, or vice versa what even more scary would be if New Jersey releases the lockdown Pennsylvania is still under lockdown because they went under, under lockdown a week later and our restaurants start opening up again and people from Pennsylvania don't want to be locked down and they just come to our restaurants when they're still <laughs> sick I mean, it's going to be it's going to be logistically uh, tricky. So, and and I and the bigger the bigger question for the economy is not when the government regulations say we're going to open, but when people feel comfortable, are we when are we going to open again? Because if the government is open and the and the and New Jersey opens up again, but people in New Jersey want to stay home because we don't want to risk getting infected and going out, then guess what? That there goes the economy still. That's a delayed recovery. So um, this is going to be a, a challenge. Yeah. Um, and, and looking Mike, at the models, well, one thing that was a, was an early um, an early question was, will this die down in the summer? Just the spread. It's a respiratory disease, warmer weather, the flu, other things die down in the summer. Will this die down in the summer too? Um, and so we've started to get additional evidence from that. Um, when so when you look at the flu, the R values, this number of spread, 
reduces by approximately 40% in the Northeast and or in the North and uh, by approximately 20% in Florida. And so if the normal R value was three and it reduced by 40%, that would still be slightly above one. So it would still be spreading some, but it wouldn't be nearly as fast. So we probably wouldn't be have a, having a peak and a second wave so fast during the summer. But if the R, true R value was still closer to five or six, and you had a super spreader who was giving it to dozens, then maybe instead of giving it to dozens, they'd still give it to like 15 people. And that's still a problem. So I don't know that there's an easy way around that. Um, there's still lots of questions, lots of unknowns. What about antibody testing, Glenn? So, well, yeah, that's an interesting question. So antibody testing is starting to ramp up. It's not, a, it's not entirely clear how effective the antibodies are yet. And uh, so people are, have, and so, so that's still an open question. We don't know yet how long, if someone has an antibody response, how long will it last? Could it be months? Could it be years? We don't know yet. There's very, so right now there's four coronaviruses that are spreading in people that we have some evidence about. There are five, this is the fifth. We have SARS and MERS, and th those two we've heard about because they've caused previous outbreaks in places. But then it, also there's two coronaviruses that are colds. And so they don't have the severe symptoms that we've attributed to these others. And that, those have been circulating for a while. And so we can see those circulation patterns too, uh, in terms of looking at antibodies and stuff. And then of course, uh, SARS-CoV-2, the COVID-19, now, now we're seeing that the fifth one. And so when we look at antibody tests, there's a, so there's a few things to think about. So there's basically two uh, immune systems that humans have evolved with. There's the antibody immune system, the humoral immune system, and then there's the cellular immune system, just like a general, uh, like, every, like your whole body just starts to react to things, uh, but it's non-specific to any specific virus. And so we think that the, in kids, one of the reasons that kids aren't getting sick as much and aren't and, and, and certainly haven't ha aren't typically having the most severe disease is because they're not generating an antibody response. It's the cellu cellular immune system that's clearing the virus just alone, just on the cellular uh, uh, level. And so that means that kids who were exposed may not have an antibody evidence. They might not have memory of, the, of being exposed before. But that's not necessarily a bad thing because they're kids and so they're personally, they would, wouldn't be at risk for, for getting, like if they already get sick again, then it's not personally going to be a problem. The worry is that if they've gotten sick, then because they don't have an antibody response perhaps, then that means they're not going to be protecting mm -hmm. people around them. They're, they're not going to have herd immunity. And if they do get sick again, then they could, it would be just right back from the beginning. They could get people around them sick. So the whole question of whether to keep schools open or not would still be a fresh question if kids who have previously been infected can just simply get infected again in the fall. Um, other, other things to consider about the antibody test is, um, yes, yeah, so, so there's this one treatment, the um, convalescent plasma treatment that people are talking about a little bit, where basically you take plasma from people who previously were sick and you uh, take, then you take their antibodies or gen either their plasma as a whole or, gen or just uh, uh, they take the antibodies out of it so it's more um, concentrated. And what we're finding with that is that those trials do seem to be effective. So there is definitely an antibody response and, and, and that is still an area that people are looking at. Um, but, but there's still so many qu open questions about what the antibodies look like, it's, it's unclear. Glenn, we have a question from Harry Grossman. Okay. Glenn, so the question is, there's a 48 hour, 72 hour period before people start showing symptoms. In that period, are there antibodies or is that test going to be a saliva test or some sort of nasal test? Here, let me pull something up. Uh, so this is what I presented last week. Let me see if I can um, do it real quickly. Sorry, Zoom. Give me one second. Oh, there it is. Okay. 
All right, now I'm going to have to just mute this for a second. This, let me come down to this one. All right, can you see my screen okay? So basically, uh, this is not hard, easy to see at all. All right, let me, let me reduce this a little bit. All right, so basically what we're looking at, I know it's a little bit hard to see, but what we're looking at is, um, um, so there's three lines there essentially for each, so each one, each graph is a separate patient. What you see is that there's the first thing is that the, the um, yellow, brown, and, and black line, the solid lines, are three different places in which the virus was tested for. So these were RNA tests for the virus. Um, and you'll notice that there was somewhat wide variation in where you, when you test in different places, you're going to get different uh, amount of, of RNA in different places. So for instance, if you look at the top left-hand corner, um, oh, you can see my mask. Um, you can see up here on the sixth day, there was uh, uh, in the spit, there, in, uh, there, was there was a high level of viral load, but in the swab at the back of the nose, there was a very low num amount of viral load. So depending on how the test was administered, you're going to get wide variation. So, so you, you would have a false negative here. This was, so this dotted line for each of the patients is the detectable limit for the standard tests uh, that would be given out uh, that, that people are being tested under. So that means that under the yellow, under the swab test, they would have had a negative result, a false negative result, which is bad because then they would have been sent back uh, out and said, oh no, you don't have it, you don't have to worry, when really they were positive, as you can see from the, from the orange, and we're out infecting people. Um, and so, so that's the first thing, these, this false negative, false positive, where we're testing people, and the test itself might be accurate, but simply where you test in the body is going to give you a false result potentially. The other thing to point you out to, to, your, to your point in particular is the antibody test. So if you look over here, you see this arrow pointing down on each of them, the arrow is pointing down. That's the point where antibodies were first detected in each of the people. And so interestingly, like, so for instance, if you look here back again at this first patient where this was the yellow, this was the swab test, you'll notice that the viral load dropped dramatically even to undetectable levels prior to the first antibody response that, we could, be, uh, that could be found. And so that, that, to me, this indicates that it was the cellular immune system that was really having a huge impact there, or that there were antibody stuff going on that just couldn't be detected with the available tests. Um, but, but so what this means is that there's a, it's complicated. There's a lot of stuff going on. For a lot of these people, I mean, look at this, look at this person. This person in the middle, in the middle, or look at this one down here, the lower left-hand corner. So this person, these bars on the top represented when the symptoms stopped. So the symptoms stopped over here. You can see, even though the symptoms stopped, the viral load was just as high as it had been when the symptoms were going on. And so the person still had detectable virus uh, weeks after the, the symptoms stopped. The antibodies started, uh, maybe five days, what is this, like five days after the symptoms stopped. So there was this p window of time where the person was feeling completely fine and the, and the viral load was still going on and they had no antibody response at that point. And that seems to be fairly common. Look at all, when you look at the bars going across, this was from one small study. These were the t all the people in that small study. It's taking a while to get more data coming out, but you'll see that the symptoms, this, the bar, the, this horizontal bar up here is when this is the symptoms and when the symptoms start, stop, the viral activity is still just continuing on for weeks after. And that, that's problematic. And that, that's why probably what we're going to hear is that even people who get symptoms, so, so if, you, if you think you've been exposed, then you're going to need to be quarantined. If there's a five-day incubation, it could be as long as, let's say, 12, 14 days possibly for incubation. You're going to need to be tested multiple times during that period just to see if you have it uh, without having symptoms. Then after you get symptoms, so this was in the context, context of a study. Each dot was a separate test that was administered. If we're going to test each person 50 times, there's not going to be enough tests in the United States to do that. 
we're probably we're talking about having enough tests for like one person for for a fraction of the population and so that means that that this seeing this type of dynamic is really going to be tricky for us and if we're going to be on the safe side then what it means is that if someone tests positive then we're probably going to need them to stay in quarantine at least two weeks after after they their symptoms stop it, and maybe and then and then be tested again there's, there's still this question, this open question about reactivation. Um, and so reactivation could be due to one of five things. Um, I was talking uh, yesterday about this. Um, so basically, it could be due. So, so essentially, we, when people are talking about reactivation, it's this idea that I can, I can stop sharing this now. It's the idea that, um, that someone tests positive, they have the COVID-19, then they test negative, Typically, to, to, to count, it has to a patient has to test negative for two days in a row, so it was to, to make it less likely that it was a false negative that they had. They have to test negative for two days in a row. What we're finding is that some people, at this point, it's an increasing number of people, we don't know what the total number will be yet, um, test positive again at some point after they've tested negative for two days. And so there's a couple, there's five possible things that could be going on. One, those two negative tests could have been false tests. So there could have been something wrong with the test itself. Two, um, it could have been a false positive test afterwards. So maybe they still were negative, but when they were tested again afterwards, it was a false positive. And so that, so that could be a reason. Three, there could be reactivation of the, of the um, vir virus that they had in their body where it just went under, for, like it was like just uh, hit down for a while based on the immune system, but then was hiding somewhere. And then at some later period, it then reemerged. And so that would be a third option. A fourth possibility is that it didn't prevent, protect. So being infected by, the, by it once didn't pr protect from being in, uh, infected a second time by someone else. And they might've been reinfected from someone else out there. And then the fifth possibility is, um, Oh, I don't remember. We had, we talked about the false negative, the false positive. Um, th those are pretty much all the options. You can see the distinction between them just based on tests. So we will be able to get more information over the coming weeks and months to really detail what's going on here. So for instance, if someone uh, has an a, a infection after they thought they'd cleared it, we can look at the underlying genome and we can see, is it the same uh, virus or was it a different virus that is infecting these people on common uh, in general? And so that can help us to see if it was reinfection or the same infection. We can look at the test to see if it is um, a problem with the test by having uh, a, a additional tests to, to rule out the false positive or the false negative. So we can really, really start digging into these things. I was just talking for a while. So I, what, what was the question? Did I answer your question, Harry Grossman? <laughs> <laughs> Beck, can you un unmute? Unmute Arlene. <laughs> yes, you answered his question. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Harry Grossman. <laughs> okay, next up, we have a question from David Biskowitz. David, you seem to be on the go. There you are. Welcome. Hi, thank you. I think maybe my question is partially been answered, but when it was related to the study you were showing where there was different levels from each test um, based on where it was administered. Was one of those lines actually, did you mention one of them was the real viral load or, or were they just, just because, I mean, how would they know the real viral load? Is there a different way they were testing that? Well, well so the viral load, what they're testing is the, vi is the viral load at the different sites. So, so the way that they do these RNA tests or the first set that were coming out was something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction. And essentially the way that that works is they take a sample of the virus and then they amplify it and replicate it. And essentially what they're doing is they amplify it, pardon me, mo like multiple times. You're talking about 30, 40, 50 times. And each time you amplify the signal a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more. At, when you get to the standard approach, I, forget, I don't know exactly what the details are in terms of getting the number, but it can tell you the volume of the RNA. So essentially the viral load at the different locations in which the test was taken. So, so yeah, we are talking about viral load. It's not simply dichotomous. It's like, yes, they have it or no, they have it. But in the, in the slide that I shared with you, it is the viral load. Most of these tests that are given just to, uh, as a, uh, to, that are given to the population are less sophisticated because for the sake of, of time and cost, 
you don't want to do the whole like a, a whole viral load test you don't want to do as, as complicated an approach instead you take maybe a few snippets of the virus and then you just do a dichotomous test and it's either positive or negative the, the problem with it is that you do get more false positives and false negatives by taking this approach but the benefit is that you can massively do it to tens of thousands of people pretty rapidly so it's a trade-off Okay, thank you. So basically in this study they were doing, at the same time, they kept doing the test in, in those three or four different areas all at the same time to compare results at the exactly. same time in the study, right? Yeah, exactly okay. right. I mean, and it makes sense. Like, and, and the other thing too is that was the, the uh, virus, the RNA that they were finding. They don't know if they were viable in the different places. So for instance, if they found virus in the feces, it could have been that someone was coughing, swallowed it, and then defecated it out so that you were finding the RNA traces in the feces, but you couldn't, but it wasn't catching. It was, it was, uh, but we don't know. We have no, we haven't been able to, to test that yet uh, to know if it's viable or not. That's the other thing about the reactivation. We don't know if that's just continuing viral shedding of just an, a residual artifact of the virus that's just the destroyed virus and not viable virus, or if it's actually a, a, a replicating virus that's an ongoing infection. This, these things we don't know yet. Thank you for your question, David. Does anyone else have some questions they'd like to ask? Um, Deborah Weisletter, I see your hands. Shall I unmute you? There you go. Be Becky, can you mute everyone else and then unmute Deborah? Okay. Hi, Glenn. Um, would it be a fair statement to say that we won't be safe until there's a vaccine? And the second part of that question, is 12 to 18 months still an accurate time frame till we see a vaccine? So will we be safe? Um, that's, it's a, well, that's a tricky question. So a lot of countries, not a lot, multiple countries have demonstrated success at not having a wave of infections simply by testing and tracing. So there is an ongoing risk, typical, it's roughly the same as a, maybe a, a typical flu season in those countries or, or less than a typical flu season um, for, for that most at-risk people where they can avoid most people getting sick. And so it would be like walking around as if it were January and the risk of, of people in their 70s, 80s just getting the flu. So just a, a risk like that. And that, I mean, that's a normal January, which doesn't make us more scared than normal. And, and we'd have a really good idea based on our testing, how successful we are by keeping it to those levels, if, if testing is good. There's still some risk, but it wouldn't be large. And so, I mean, it, it would be as safe as you would normally feel in January, let's say. Um, there are new drugs that are coming up. So for instance, um, the Scalia drug, um, is interesting. We don't know yet what it, what it's going to uh, if it's going to be truly effective. It's an infusion drug, which means it's probably only going to be hospital administered. Um, mm -hmm. It's not something that you just pop a pill in the morning when you wake up at home. Um, but there are new other drugs being evaluated. If we get a, if we find a drug or a combination of drugs that work to prevent severe morbidity and mortality in people, then that would eliminate the fear because then even if people got sick they could just go and get treated and they wouldn't have to worry about it. And so that could, that could eliminate it on a much quicker level um, where we wouldn't have to vaccinate the population. Um, vaccines, there's a couple possibilities. There's antibody vaccines that are being evaluated. Those probably will take a little bit longer. Those are the 12 to 18 months we might be looking at. On the shorter term, or I've been uh, talked about previously, the BCG vaccine for tuberculosis. If that comes, if that works, I think the, the, the um, clinical trials are set for six months, but all of these trials, regardless of the drugs, regardless of everything, if they're found to be extremely effective, then every clinical trial will have what's called early stopping rules. And so maybe they'll take a sneak peek instead of at six months that when it's supposed to end, they'll take a sneak peek at three months or maybe even two months, or maybe more likely three months. Um, and they'll see, is it effective? Because if it's not effective, if it's the if it's the, the wrong way, if it's if it, it's more likely to kill people, let's say that the treatment that they're giving, 
they'd want to end it immediately as soon as possible so that they don't kill any more people. And similarly, if it was really effective, not, like not just like a little effective, but extraordinarily effective, then that would be another reason to have an early stopping rule kick in where you wouldn't, you wouldn't uh, want to continue putting people on a placebo because that would be unethical when you have this really effective treatment that's saving mm -hmm. all these people. So it's possible that even within three months, we might start finding results that are, are sooner of drugs or, or the tuberculosis vaccine or, or other that might prove that we, that we should start ramping this stuff up and start doing it. Um, the treatments I think might be even sooner. A lot of it has to do with um, how quickly we can get people into the clinical trials. And the, one of, the, one of the, the, the unfortunate, I don't know about unfortunate is not the right word. One of the counterintuitive things is that as you have a big increase in the number of infected people, then it's easier to recruit because you have more people that are getting sick. But once we're under lockdown, like we've been for a, what, like a month now, then less and less people are getting sick. So it's harder and harder to recruit. And so if you have less and less people available to recruit, then you actually push out way into the future how long the clinical trial is gonna take because it's gonna take you months longer to recruit new people who are getting sick. Because we only know if the drug works if people are sick and then are, are treated successfully or prevented from getting sick from it. So, so stuff like this is better to, to the, the clinical trials will be faster the sooner that we can do it when, the, when we're in the uptake. Once we're, on the, once we're under lockdown, it's much, much harder to recruit people. So that'll be a little tricky. Thanks, Glenn. Thank you. Thank you. Great question, Deborah. Next up, David Viskowitz has another question. David, I'll unmute you. Yes, hi, Glenn. This is related to kind of just to the previous question, but I know you mentioned about three months for potential treatment. Sorry for the noise. I'm not walking. Um, but um, I know, um, like I've even heard Gilead expects to already lease some numbers even at the end of this month because i guess the trials have been going on since march already some of them so do we think it's potentially three months from when they started or are you saying three months from today or, or kind of where you're at with that well so so it all depends on the clinical trial i was just speaking broadly across just clinical trials in general why they take so long um it's that it just takes a long time to figure out safety and efficacy and there's different stages that you typically go at the gilead drug when they were when so so when they say they're going to report out that would most likely be for the end of their clinical trial, like what their clinical trial was, was powered for, the number of patients that they were recruiting for. What I'm saying is that if the drug worked exception, so, so basically it's just an, um, the way statistics works is that the stronger the effect, the more confidence we have in the effect. And the weaker the effect of a drug or whatever the clinical trial is looking at, then the less confidence we have. So in order to make something statistically significant, it, it, it it almost ha it's easier if it has a much bigger effect and a much bigger clinical significance. There's a relationship. It's not all together. Sometimes things can be statistically significant and not clinically meaningful or clinically meaningful, but not necessarily statistically significant. But generally, the bigger the effect size, the, the easier it is to prove that it works. And so they, when they set the trial to say whether it works or not, they were pre-assuming what that level would be, what that threshold of effect would need to be. And so powering, the, so powering means the number of patients you have to recruit in order to demonstrate that effect at a statistical significant level. And so if they're on target and they report out at that number, then it could be that it works effectively. If, it, if they report out earlier, then it could mean either that it is way more effective than they even thought that it was, and it would be unethical to continue, and so they would stop it early, and they would and, and they would start recommending use. Or, uh, God forbid, if it's the other way, and they find that it's not only not working but causing harm, then that would be another reason to stop it early. So it could. So there is a potential that it could stop early if it hits a mark, if it's more effective than we thought. If it hits when we when they say it's going to hit at the norm when they when they in, anticipated just under normal conditions it would end. Then, then it could still be effective, but it means it's not as effective as it would have uh, triggered the early, the early stopping. There, there was a release, I think it was um, a couple of days ago, um, where apparently someone at, I think University of Chicago or some school was at a video conference internally to their school, and they were saying that it worked really great in their clinic. 
Um, but that was just one sample out of many. It was not controlled. And so they made, it generated a lot of media uh, a few days ago in terms of, in terms of uh, oh, wow, this drug is so great. It's going to be the next best thing. But, um, but it's not, it's, we can't really use that as evidence for anything in terms of what will ultimately happen. Um, hopefully it's great, but we, we don't know yet. The first, so, so there's two, the two signals, like I said. The, the, when it ends, when, it's, when it finally reports out, when, it, when they plan to, that would be the normal one. And, and it could still be a really good, effective drug if it is proved successful at that point. Or, like I said, there's a possibility it could have early reporting uh, rules and, and be more effective than we thought and report out earlier. But that's just how this stuff works. John, do you have a question? Hold on, I'm, I'll unmute you. Here we go. Uh, hi, John. Thank you. Hi, hi, hi. hi. Um, Glenn, are they talking effectiveness in terms of viral load or symptoms? Because right. my son has friends that are positive and they have absolutely no symptoms. Right, so that's a really, really good distinction. So the viral load has been thought to be a marker for the magnitude of the disease. But the virus, see, it's really interesting. It's like an artifact. Um, oh shoot, what was the movie? The, not the Armageddon strain, but the, um, that was like from the 60s or 70s, that sci-fi movie, um, whatever that movie was. <laughs> Basically, you remember there's a classic scene in it where, um, where they were testing, they had all these samples and they were testing different drugs against it, trying to identify what could stop it in the Petri dish, what could stop the virus from spreading. And so when you take this approach, and that's what we were doing here too for, our, for this virus, and when you take that approach, you, you're biasing yourself to find treatments that affect the virus. When in reality, most people who are getting sick and when they're in the hospital, we re they really need immunomodulatory drugs because they have the cytokine storms, they have other things that are really yeah. causing them problems. And so they're two that, that, so it's not necessarily a one drug fits all type of thing, but I mean, it could be. I mean, we could find that when you have a dramatic decrease in the viral load very quickly, then you also have these clinical outcomes. So for the, for, the, for the clinical trials, what they ought to be testing are hard endpoints other than just the viral load. Because if the virus goes up and down, it has no impact on the outcomes, then who cares? But, yeah. um, but presumably they're looking at th hard, hard things like mortality rates, which would be very easy to track, and, um, and also, and presumably all-cause mortality. And then also even things like uh, lung lesions in the lung and things like that, which can be clearly seen and can see if it has an impact on that. And I'm, I'm, pr I'm confident that they're looking at these harder endpoints, the, cl the mid uh, clinically meaningful endpoints. Thanks. Sure. More questions? Um, <laughs> Nina, Nina has a question. Hi, Nina. There you go. You're on Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Thanks, Glenn, for explaining everything. And I have this question that you explained that the test can be taken from a nasal swab or spit or stool. And have they figured out the relationship, let's say somebody has uh, gastrointestinal symptoms rather than cough and um, runny nose or something. And uh, so no, is it based on what tests they have at the moment or is it based on, you know, figuring out what the optimal test for the person's symptoms might be? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. As far as I, so I'm not really on that side of it right now. I'm, I'm more of like a lounge chair epidemiologist, right? I have my day job and I keep up with the news in, in, in terms of the scientific literature. But they're, the people on the front line in terms of public health, most likely what they're doing is they have a standard approach to um, giving the test in the same way to everybody. And that, I think the way that that works is probably a nasal swab, and it, it seems like is what they're doing to everyone. And if that captures the vast majority of people successfully in terms of simply identifying if they're positive or negative, then that would be a consistent way to do it. Because the alternative would, have, would be to give each person multiple tests. And because we just don't have enough tests out there, we, we can't do that. So that means that we have to constrain ourselves to giving the test where it's most likely to be positive if we if, if the person has it, even if we know it's not going to be a hundred percent certain. So so we still don't know yet. But um, but yeah, a lot of so it's an interesting question. There's so there's been a, more results over the last week or so looking at asymptomatic uh, people. So what does that mean? So we know that of all people who become symptomatic, 
they typically don't become symptomatic until maybe the fifth day on average, which means that 100% of, pardon me, 100% of people who eventually will have symptoms, 100% of them are asymptomatic for five days beforehand. So if you were to test for virus, um, because you can you can detect it earlier. It's not it's not meaningful numbers until the two days before where it start can, can really infect people. But using the PCR, you can detect it, it, it even below that um, at, at earlier days. But what it means is that um, that they, we've had like four or five different uh, uh, tests in the United States now where they've just tested everyone in a whole population or they've sampled large populations of people. I, I think one was in Southern California. Um, one was in um, uh, Boston, a Boston suburb. One was, oh, that boat, the, the Navy ship where the captain was fired. Uh, he, one of the things he had done before he got fired was he, he mandated that every single person on the ship get tested. And so now we have more evidence in terms of what the percentages are. And what we're finding is that in, depending on the place, there's a lot of people who potentially have been inf infected. In Southern California, when they did the test, they found, I think, that like two to three percent order of magnitude of the population had been infected, um, and and a lot of them, maybe a, a quite a large percentage of them, were asymptomatic at the time of testing. We don't know if they were asymptomatic throughout the whole disease course because it was just a snapshot in time, not looking at people across time. But we we know that a lot of them in that snapshot were asymptomatic. Similarly, in Boston, it was quite a bit higher it was like one third of the town that was investigated was positive. Um, and similarly in Boston, in that suburb, there was um, a, a lot of as asymptomatic people. The vast majority were asymptomatic and had no idea that they had. Um, on the ship where the captain was fired, similarly, a large number of asymptomatic people, um, quite a lot of people uh, ultimately were infected by the end. It just, went, it just ravaged the ship um, and, and there were a lot of asymptomatic people. But like I said, we don't know just from those tests, they're just a snapshot in time. We don't know if those people would ultimately have become symptomatic and then we would have identified them through testing then or whether they would have just stayed asymptomatic for weeks and we wouldn't have even known unless they'd been tested. This is, this is so unknown, but it's interesting. There's wide variation now. We don't know what makes some people more, more susceptible than other people. We don't know these kinds of things yet. We know that the risk, that there's risk associated with age, some comorbidities, that kind of stuff. But, but even despite this, we, we've seen 100-year-olds who have been infected and, re and recovered just fine with no long-term adverse effects, but, or at least in the, in the couple of weeks since they've recovered. Um, and then we've seen other people who are, who are 30 who died, and we just don't know what's, what's really driving this distinction right now. But, but we do know that it's a really strong predictor, that the older someone is, they're way more likely to, to experience more morbidity and mortality than, than younger people, even though we hear these case studies. Rachel, you, you look like you have a question. I do. Okay. Question, are there any local studies like that are looking at different types of symptoms? Like for instance, if someone appears to have a cold with no fever or an allergy type thing, or is there anywhere where somebody could go to get tested to see, like, are they looking at that data to see how different the disease could be across somebody who might normally be asymptomatic, but like has a cold that would be ignored or an allergy or something? Yeah, I'm sure that they're looking at everything now, just trying to figure out anything they can. Epidemiologists like to be, think of themselves as creative people. So I'm sure that like any test you can be imagining, they're going and they're digging in to try to, try to look. Um, but in terms of systematically doing that, it's a challenge. Right now, because of the limit in the number of tests, in most places, it's limited to people who have symptoms. Mm -hmm. And the symptoms it's limited to are the symptoms that we've all heard about, not the wide variety of symptoms you might be talking about. So for instance, if someone has a headache and no other symptoms, that could be their only symptom they had that demonstrates that they had COVID-19, but it wouldn't be something to trigger a test. So we wouldn't know. Um, but over time, so this type of thing is called a natural history study that you're talking about. And as testing becomes more widely available, we'll be able to accumulate this uh, type of thing much more easily. But, but there's a lot, you, you can imagine this right now, it's kind of an all hands on deck type of thing. So you have epidemiologists, doctors, public health people, like everyone just who has any interest at all with capacity is just going and studying this right now. It's just, even though it feels like the last month 
has been like two years, it's really only been a month. And studies take a couple of months to get them out. You have to do the, to collect the data, do the analyses, write it up. So people are, are doing it rapidly, but I mean, it's only, it's, it takes time to publish all this stuff. So the, there's definitely a, um, a exponential growth in publications like we're seeing with the virus itself. So then these people, these asymptomatic people that are getting tested are really only just from those studies where like the cruise ship, they tested everybody or like there's no other oh. widespread asymptomatic testing program going on. And anything that we, that any type of testing program would be published because everyone tries to get it out. Like no one would keep that to themselves. Everyone would try to get it out as quickly as possible. I mean, there were some others and they're starting to increase in terms of being published. The problem is that, okay, so taking a snapshot in time is easy to do. You take, you maybe spend a day or two, swab everyone, and then you can get to get, collect all the data, write it up, publish it. And then like a week or two later, you have it out published. If you're doing it longitudinally, where you're saying, okay, are these asymptomatic people asymptomatic for a week or two weeks, that requires following them for a week or two weeks and then collecting all the final data and publishing it. So that takes way longer. So a study like that by design, we wouldn't even hear about for weeks until after the snapshots. So it just makes sense we hear the snapshots first. Um, but it's fascinating. There was another study like that where they were looking at a homeless shelter. Uh, I don't remember where it was in exactly, but it was some homeless shelter somewhere. And the, a lot of the people were infected. The vast, vast majority there were um, asymptomatic. But again, it's this limitation that I was saying. You don't know if they're asymptomatic because they're, they've had it for a couple of weeks and are asymptomatic or they're asymptomatic because they were just infected in the homeless shelter yesterday or two days ago, and now they have vir virus that's re uh, present. They just haven't developed the symptoms yet. It's, we, it's too early. Looks like Harry Grossman has another question. <laughs> Let's unmute you. Okay. Wait, Hold on. Dad, Dad, let me do it. Uh, let's try it this it's way. Arlene. I just did it. Okay. The question is, can you expect that this virus is going to mutate like the seasonal flu, flu, meaning that the virus that you're chasing now, by the time we get to next winter, is going to mutate that um, whatever vaccine or drugs that you're going to develop to treat this flu would not be effective against the mutated virus? So that's not likely to be the case. It's interesting. So this has been studied more and more. Right now, oh, uh, should I forget the last? As, as of a day or two ago, there were like five or six strains that have been visible across the country. So basically, so the virus is, a, is, a, is an organism. It's a species. And so you can see it uh, not necessarily evolving, but you can see mutation over time, depending on how it's spread across different people in different countries. And so we can track very easily to see that the virus that's most common on the East Coast, at least the Northeast of the United States currently, was transmitted by someone who, uh, who, who got it in Europe. And the person in Europe got it, might have gotten it from someone else. And it's interesting, our strain here is not the one that's common in Italy, it's the common one that's common more in, in Germany and some other parts of Europe. So someone from one of those areas came here. And so what we're seeing is there's like five or six, when you tra trace it on the map, you can see very clearly what the, co what the, the uh, mutations are that are common across the US. And so then you can see where it came from, like where did the spread come from? So for instance, on the West Coast in California, I think that that was more likely uh, some uh, parts of Asia that that came from, or maybe China or Wuhan. But, re but really we're sp it's spreading from all these different places. And so to answer your question, so we've been looking, so a bunch of labs, so geneticists who are now want to add value during this pandemic, a lot of genetics labs have been looking at the RNA samples from across the world, trying to see what does the mutation rate look like. And what they found is that the part of the RNA that's responsible for infecting the cells and for a lot of the things that we think in terms of how quickly it spreads, that part is not changing at all, is not mutating at all. Apparently what's unique about the flu is it wears like a camouflage mask on, the, on its surface. And so it can very quickly just change the camouflage on the top, the mask on the top. 
Maybe it makes it look like it has brown hair or puts on a different wig or puts on makeup or something. It looks like a different virus every year. So even though the, the core of it is staying roughly the same, the camouflage on the surface is what the antibody sees. And so it can fool the antibody. That's, a bit, that's an evolved strategy, particular to the flu. For, for the coronavirus that we're talking about, it doesn't have that kind of surface that camouflages itself or changes so much. And so because of that, the mutations we're seeing are just, are just an artifact and we can see how it's changing, but it doesn't really be, seem like it's changing the behavior at all in terms of what that means. So what that means is that in terms of a seasonality to it, right now, it's probably not going to be a seasonality due to mutations like we see in the flu. However, depending on the antibody response in the people, if our antibodies don't last that long, if our antibodies only last a few months or a year, then that means that the same virus, not mutating at all, can reinfect us potentially in another year. So that could be problematic. So then we'd still have the very same seasonality concerns as if it had been mutating. Hold on, Dad, I'm muting you. There we go. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have any other questions? I'm looking for hands or you can send it to me in the chat box. John, looks like you have a question. Uh, no, actually I was just reading my text from my brother. <laughs> it just pops up on the top and I was trying to uh, oh, good. read it, but Glenn, I want to thank you. You know, I, it's, you know, it's, it's an ongoing changing situation. And uh, I think we're all as frustrated as I'm sure you are with it. But, uh, you know, I think you've explained a lot to me anyway. <laughs> and I appreciate it. Oh, good. Uh, my brother's I on the other line, so I got to run. Thanks again. Goodbye to everybody. I don't know how to get out of this. <laughs> Len, I have a question for you. What's up? How are you handling your groceries? Are you wiping down the containers? Are you unpacking your groceries wearing gloves? What are you doing and what do you recommend? So personally, it's one, it's one of the strange things about this virus that personally, I am not in a high risk category. So I'm wearing a mask out when I go food shopping, but I'm not taking extreme precautions in terms of looking at making sure I don't get infected. People who are older, say in their 50s and particularly 60s, 70s, 80s, or, or particularly ones with comorbidities, then it becomes more of an issue. Um, but but it, because I'm in a low risk group, my only concern would be infecting other people. If, and if I got symptoms or if I did not get symptoms. And because I live alone, I'm not, it doesn't worry me quite so much. Um, but for most people, um, it's, yeah, I, it's, I, I wouldn't worry too much about, about it. I mean, just if you follow normal hygiene, uh, that's probably sufficient. Like when you hear, when you read things about the virus being, uh, being found in cardboard, what happens typically is that it would absorb in, inside the cardboard. So on the surface of the cardboard, you don't, wouldn't necessarily get infected, even if someone else had previously touched it. It's only what they do when they do these tests is they typically take a piece of the cardboard and then test, they just dissolve the cardboard and see if it's in there. And so then it, you're gonna be getting anything that was absorbed. Yeah, personally, um, I, I, I maybe should be more precautious in terms of the stuff that I'm touching, but I, I'm not so worried about it. The problem is the, this virus that they're finding, we don't even know if it's viable. Like if virus is on plastic, we, we, you'll find RNA uh, clips that would trigger a positive test, but it just could have been that the virus was totally destroyed. And instead of a long viable strand, you just have these clips floating around that don't have any viability at all. And right now we have no way of testing that. So we're getting these positive results when very likely it might not be viable at all. It's just a, a strand that happens to be there. It could be like a, a warship. It's like a warship that once it's destroyed, you can still see evidence that the ship was there, but it's just a residual artifact. It doesn't, it's, a, it's harmless at that point. So I, I suspect a lot of this stuff is residual. But see, this is why I'm an armchair epidemiologist and not someone on the front lines of the public health response. But um, I'm just giving my opinion in terms of what's most likely, I think. We, we appreciate your armchair as well as 
as your fireside chatting. Yeah. Like the fire? <laughs> we did. <laughs> we like that. So we have a question from Steve C. Is there a difference between the virus that came from Europe versus Asia in terms of its effects? So right now there's no difference in the behavior that's been observed. Um, we, we know that there's that the virus where it came from because there's some slight, slight mutation, just very small mutations that can be detected when you do genetic tests. But in terms of how frequently it spreads or anything else right now, we're not seeing any difference in that or in terms of severity. I, I mentioned last week that the virus is essentially the same virus that's infecting everyone. The wide variation in symptoms has to do with the person themselves, their susceptibility, their immune system, their physiology. The virus is the same virus. And so it's, it's things going on in the person rather than the virus that's causing the variation in the disease. All right, anyone else? What else do you want to talk about? We have a few more minutes together. Are there any other further questions? Oh, that went quick. That did go quick. Time flies when you're having fun. Yeah. Oh, um, there's another hand from Harry. You have a lot of questions, Harry Grossman. Yeah, but, like, what do you think the probability is of uh, developing a medication, utilizing one that's already on the market, within the next few months to be able to treat at least the symptoms of somebody getting the disease? Well, so that's being heavily investigated. Oh, I can come back to this after your question, but so the World Health Organization is, um, in, they're, they're sponsoring these massive cross-country clinical trials of the leading contenders that they identified in early March of these treatments that already existed that they're going to look at. Um, the more, so it, again, it has to do with the recruitment. The more people that are infected and that they can recruit in, then the shorter the timeline of, of, of uh, recruitment, the shorter the timeline of the trial. But the longer it takes them to recruit patients, then the longer the trial is going to be for to, to see it report out. So I yeah I don't know I don't know when when we're expecting that. Gilead indicated that that by early May it sounds like we're going to have some results from them. Um, that drug was looked it, I think it was developed originally for either Ebola or for SARS uh, almost 15 years ago. And, um, and so I, I don't know, that, that one is a little bit trickier because it hasn't been widely used. So we don't know what its safety profile looks like. Other drugs like the malarial drugs, we, we do have a better sense of their safety profile. The safety profile is not great, but, but at least we know what they are. Um, in the coming months, there's additional sources of evidence that we'll know. So as so many people have started getting sick, we'll be able to start looking in data, in data sets and endocrinologists, for instance, might be able to say, oh, you know, I have a subset of my patients that just none of them got sick or none of them got seriously ill, whereas all of my other patients, a percentage of them did get sick or did get ill. And then they could go and look at those patients and say, oh, you know, there's a diabetes medicine that no one had even thought about that's protective. Or there could be a rheumatologist. So some of, this, some of these drugs are uh, like the malarial medication was also used in lupus and rheumatoid arthritis. So it was an immunomodulatory drug. There might be other conditions that are immuno condition, immune conditions where, where some rheumatologists might see their patients and might say, I've noticed that not a single patient in my practice taking this drug got sick. And then what you'll see is rheumatologists will talk among themselves and then they'll say, wow, we should look into this. And then you'll start seeing signals. And so it takes a while for these signals to start appearing because patients haven't been going to the physicians very much yet. But as the economy starts to open up and people start going back to their doctors and start, and start going back out again, then these other drugs, which hadn't even been considered, might start to be identified. So with so maybe three to six months, we might, if, if, if there's new candidates that, become, that we become aware of, and then we start clinical trials for those and start pursuing them, like I said earlier, the stronger the effect that might be there, the quicker we'll be able to see if it's really a, a real effect or not, then I mean, within six months, maybe there will be other drugs that we'll find that are available. So I don't know. All right, Beck, I see someone else has a question. Oh, Becky's Wi-Fi just went down. All right, David was, I think David Brodsky, she said. David, did you have a question? I don't know if it, 
Oh yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Thanks, Glenn. This is great. Um, my question was just uh, if you can explain a bit about what the virus is attacking in the body and what mechanisms it's using to do so. Uh, to the yeah. So I can't describe it very much, <laughs> uh, just because I don't know as much about that part. I think it's the ACE2 receptor, and so it's interesting. So in apparently in bats. There are, so I, I don't know how many ACE receptors we have in the human body. If we have at least the two because we have ACE1 and ACE2, at least we know, uh, or at least I know. I, my my uh, understanding of this area is poor. In bats, there are way more ACE receptors. And it seems like because we know that this evolved, that it wasn't created in a lab, that it evolved over time, it was a warfare. Whoops. Give me one sec. I have to just uh, bring Becky back in. All right. I don't know what just happened. Oh, here it is. Give me one second. <laughs> OK, Becky, I've just made you host again. Thanks. All Sorry. right. So, yeah, so we, we know, yeah. oh, that's, oh, that's OK. Welcome back. Just to wait a sec. I'm just answering questions. So we know with bats that there was an arms race, and so the bats evolved multiple different kinds of these ACE receptors. The, and so the virus, then typically viruses are very, very specific for species and then also very, very specific for receptors and for specific types of cells. So you might have some virus that infects a specific type of tissue and others that don't. Like, so you have all sorts of organisms on, our, on the surface of our skin that wouldn't be viable at all in, inside of our body. And so, the ACE2 receptor that this links to is very common in the skin cells in our, that go down to our lungs, the, the epithelial cells. But, and so that's why it's a respiratory disease. And for a lot of respiratory diseases, the strategy that the virus has taken on to, to spread outside of the host is by coughing or sneezing or that kind of stuff. This, this virus doesn't do sneezing so much, but it does co uses coughing as a, as a mechanism. But what we're finding, so that the ACE2 receptor is also common in other parts of the body, like in the gastrointestinal tract, there's epithelial cells all throughout the body, there's lots of epithelial cells. And so that's why symptoms can vary. One of the, because this virus evolved for the bat, it's highly, highly specific for the bat. Usually when a virus jumps to a different species like it has for us, the whole, all of its armory that it's developed for the bats, some of it works effectively, quite effectively against humans, but some of it might not do, be effective at all. Like we don't even know what some of it does because it was highly trained and highly, highly evolved specifically to infect the bats. So, so it's unclear yet in terms of what that looks like for us. Early on, we thought that some of the, um, some drugs like Advil and stuff might be, uh, that if you took Advil a lot, that it might actually promote the growth of the virus or help the virus to get in because you'd have more of the receptor expressing. Um, but then, we, then we realized there wasn't actually any evidence to, to show that that was the case. Um, I don't know if there's any new evidence yet that people are looking at this, but um, as far as I know, it's, it's still, there's a lot of unknowns in terms of what, what's going on with it. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I can look into more about the receptor issue and report back next Sunday. Thank you, Glenn. So I think our, our last question for today is from David Biskowitz. Do you see the, do you see his question? They mentioned the virus can spread through the mouth, nose, and eyes. Can it happen through the ear canal? <laughs> um, well, I mean, so this, we have this question about the viability. So just because we're finding that the virus is there when you do a test doesn't mean it's the full strand of the virus that can fully replicate. And so, so I mean, we're finding virus throughout the body. I mean, you find it in stool, you find it all over the body. And so that means that potentially you could get it from the ear canal if there is viable virus. Um, whether it's being excreted there or just someone like is coughing into their hand and then touching their ear. I mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm not sure. Is there a reason why that that's a very specific question? Does uh, David have a very, uh, have a reason why he, why the ear canal is, is of such interest? Here, can you unmute David again? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was more just um, a curiosity because I mean, I know it's, it's obviously a way into the body. It's an opening, so I was just curious if it's, it's possible because you don't hear him mention it. So it was more your curiosity, yeah. Well, the ear actually isn't. So the ear is protected because we have our eardrum 
So the ear is actually outside of the body, whereas our, our lungs go and, and, and our mouth going in, it's, that can actually get into the body in a way that your ear cannot pan. Um, because, of, because it's so, so like if, if you get something in your ear, it doesn't actually go into your body. It's, it's still protected. It's like a, a, a hole in your head, but it doesn't go all the way through your body. So it's, it's, it's protected in a way that, that the throat or the nose or the, or the um, other parts of your body are not. But I, I mean, in terms of, okay, but, if you can get an ear but infection. Potentially, ear, right. ear wax though could potentially carry it, right? Potentially, right. Yeah. Yeah, I get. I mean, I guess I don't know. Um, it's I. I don't know in terms of the shedding. Um, I mean, there's certainly skin epithelial cells. I don't know what the, how common the ACE2 receptor is uh, lining the ear, but um, yeah, I hadn't thought about that. I don't. I don't know. You, you know what's interesting? So before that was the. I, I mean, if you have other questions, I could talk for a little longer. One really interesting thing. I have some friends who live abroad who are talking about these things. And there's a proliferation of conspiracy theories abroad. And apparently the same way in our country that a lot of Trump supporters or, or far right people want to be, are going out and saying, we don't want to be under lockdown anymore. And they're going and having rallies around our country. This is happening in other countries too. And apparently one of the key signals to stop the lockdown in other countries is to carry the American flag. Because that shows that you agree with Donald Trump and that you need to end the lockdown now. So apparently I talked to friends in Brazil and some parts of Europe where people are literally having rallies holding the American flag to demonstrate that they want to stop the lockdown, which is just so crazy. But there, there's some really insane conspiracy theories that are getting traction. Like I think right now, the, like, the last survey I saw, approximately one third of the American public believes that this virus was made in a lab in China. And that's insane. Like that's a really large number. And my worry is that if people authentically believe conspiracy theories, then it might uh, influence their behavior and, and influence them to act in ways that do not promote health and protection of the public, the public's health and well-being. So I'm worried about the communication. We don't have Good. One, one of the things that we found, it was interesting, I was writing about this on Facebook, is that when you look at uh, pandemic planning and you try to identify policies that work well for pandemics, it's an overlap of epidemiology and game theory. Because epidemiology describes the distribution and determinants of the pandemic to, to work to help to understand what's driving it and where will it go? What can we do to stop it and prevent it? And game theory talks about incentives among individuals, organizations, and, and companies, and, and other actors of what, how they'll act during a pandemic. And with these conspiracy theories, it's really gonna be influencing that when you look at it from a game theory pers perspective in terms of what people are likely to do in terms of their behavior. And it's, from my perspective, it's really fascinating. One of the things that they found from game theory was that the earlier that you have clear and accurate communication about the disease, it has a noticeable effect on reducing the transmission of the disease, on, on reducing the spread of the disease. Because if people know about it, then they're more motivated to lock down, to have social isolation, to do these things. The problem is if you have messaging that it's not, it's like you have from the top that we're seeing in the United States where it's not consistent and clear. And also if it's not accurate, then it actually promotes the spread of the disease. I mean, so we've really, there's publications where scientists have actually looked at this from previous pandemics. And you can see that if you have unclear and inaccurate communication spread from the top, that you, it actually promotes the spread of the disease. And that is really problematic right now. So luckily we have different communication at the state and local level than we do at the federal level. So hopefully the state and local level uh, could be sufficient, but we will see. Glenn, thank you, as always, for your expertise. We really appreciate everything you're sharing with us. And thank you to the audience for all of your wonderful questions, especially you, Harry Grossman. When can we reconvene, Glenn? What works well for you? We can do this time next week again. OK. If you have any questions in the interim, just send me a message over, over uh, Facebook or email or whatever, text message. And I can then do a little preparatory work, like the ACE2 receptor, I'll find out more about that. 
and uh, other questions you might have. Yeah. I'll see what I can find about viral transmission via the ear, via the ear canal uh, for next weekend too. Sounds good. Great, thanks, thanks everyone. Have a great rest of the weekend. All right, bye-bye.